In my day job, I run a company that manufactures critical monitoring systems. So we design a lot of PCBs, firmware, software, and it has to be manufactured to very high specifications. It has to be ultra reliable. Outside of that, I do a lot of custom manufacturing, so one-offs, uh, small runs of um, vintage equipment, remanufacturing, hard to find boards, that sort of thing. Now a lot of these I manufacture and assemble by hand, but sometimes I need to do a small run or a small batch where it's not practical to make them by hand, so I have a pick and place machine and a reflow oven. And the pick and place machine and the reflow oven are both low cost units. For my business I subcontract manufacturing out to specialist assembly companies but that's not really practical to do that on a, a small run basis, it just gets too expensive. So I've seen recently a lot of videos on units such as this, this is one of the reflow ovens. Um, this is not meant as an industrial oven, it's, it's meant really for very small runs, reworking, this sort of thing, but it's not meant as a, an industrial or production machine. It's built to a very low cost, it's obviously manufactured in China. And I think there's possibly unreasonable expectations placed on machines like this. I've been in manufacturing now in both small companies and large corporations for about 30 years and I can tell you that if you try to manufacture this in the UK it would be priced out of the market, there's no way you could do it. Uh, for example, something like this, the drawer alone in the UK would cost more to manufacture than you can buy this entire unit for delivered from China. Now, one of the issues you get with low manufacturing costs is obviously quality. And this unit is fundamentally a sound unit, but there are some quality issues you will find when you first take delivery. Things such as uh, sharp edges, so for example, in the drawer, these edges can be very sharp, but it's, it's you know, a minute's work to, to round them off. And the same with other issues with the machine. I think there's several videos about some of the insulation used inside is, is not really suitable for the purpose. But when you pay just a few hundred pounds for something like this, it's extremely useful because you can, you can get a sound working machine that needs maybe a few hours of work uh, by the buyer to bring it into a, a state where it can be used quite successfully. Now that's what I tend to do, I, I don't buy units like this and put them straight into use, I'll dismantle them, rework them to a certain degree and what you end up with is it's quite a reasonable unit. However, it's very like a, if you buy a soldering iron first time you pick up a soldering iron you're going to probably make a lot of horrible solder joints. You have to learn to use it and it's exactly the same with a machine like this. When you buy a big industrial reflow oven or a big industrial pick and place machine, one of the things you're getting with that machine is expertise. You're uh, essentially buying a machine that many operators could walk up to, pick a program, put a board in and it would reflow it with very little experience from the user. Having said that, you do need somebody experienced to set it up in the first place. And that's, I think, where one of the misunderstandings comes from a unit like this, where people will buy these, they'll think they can just stick a board on it and it's going to give them perfect results first time. But there are certain things you need to understand when using machines like this, and, and the first one is you have to understand the process itself. You also need to understand how the machine will present that process to you. So what, am I, what I mean by that is you cannot just open this unit, throw a board into it, pick a profile, walk away, come back 10 minutes later and have a perfectly reflowed board. What will be required is a bit of experimentation to get the best out of this machine and make it practical to use for your purpose. Also, there can be a bit frustrating to you sometimes um, the translations that are used in the menus are not always quite as clear as they could be. The operation of some of the functions is not always as clean as it would be in a, a properly highly developed machine. 
But having said that, once you get used to it, you can get very good results. And that's really what this video is, is meant to be aimed at, is how to take a unit like this and get it to give you good results. Now, most of the uh, unboxing videos, etc., I've seen with these units, somebody's taken it, opened the drawer, stuffed a temperature probe in there, and then run a profile. And they're surprised that the temperatures don't match what's on the display. And that's not surprising. The unit is designed, albeit cheaply, to heat boards, not to heat air. And you have to try and bear in mind that the profile temperatures that you see on this are meant to be indicative of the ball temperature, and that's what you have to try to establish as a, as a working profile. The other thing you will get is boards being improperly loaded into these machines. So I'll go through some of the, the issues that you're going to get if you try and get one of these machines and you're not used to uh, using pick and place or reflow ovens, especially cheap ones. So first thing, when you get one, try and get hold of a, a handful or as many small boards as you can that have at least some surface mount pads on them, such as this. You're going to need at least 30 or 40, depending on um, how lucky you are in getting the machine set up quickly. Try and make them all the same board if you keep swapping from one board design to another and different size components, then you're going to find it very difficult to get a, a consistent result and you're not going to know if it's because the board's changed or because the profile's still incorrect. So what you'll find, chances are the first time you run it, is you'll see that the profiles will say something like a 6040 lead. So you'll take a board, stick a bit of solar paste on it, drop it into the machine, close the door, the drawer, run the profile, and you'll get horrible results. It'll be something like this. I don't know how clearly this is coming out on the uh, on the video, but you can see that half the pads, or more than half the pads, are not reflowed uh, at all. Uh, some in the centre are reflowed, uh, others are just starting to run, and this was at a temperature of 237 centigrade, so it should easily, easily have reflowed at that temperature. But if you look at it, I can tell you that it was placed like this in the machine, and what's happened is the parts that have reflowed are the parts that were over the holes in the drawer. So what happens in machines like this is the big metal plate is not going to heat quickly enough to enable the profile to work. And it's not intended to. The, the idea is that uh, the bottom of the drawer is there just as a support. If you put boards directly onto it, you're going to get extremely poor results. Um, they'll vary across the board and you'll get very patchy reflow soldering. Now, it does actually say this in the manual, but in Chinglish it's, it's very difficult to try and interpret the manual unless you know exactly what it's trying to say. So, f I initially wanted to make a, a few boards up to show you how not to do it. So firstly, this is the first example. If you put the board straight onto the metal base of the, 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 the drawer and run the profile that should work for that type of solder, it almost certainly won't. The usual reaction is, well, let's turn up the temperature and you'll get something like this. Now, you can see it has actually flowed. Um, it, it's very patchy, by the way, because I just essentially squirted solder paste onto the board uh, to see how well it would flow on this particular board. Um, so all it's melted on top, it hasn't flowed through the bottom. So it's um, the board's got very hot on top, but the base has stayed fairly cold, and that's because this, again, was sitting on the metal base of the the draw. What you need to do when you're using these is lift the board off the tray. And the way I found best to do that, you can, you can actually buy inserts for these drawers, not from this company, but from other places that are designed specifically for that, but they are quite expensive. I have found by far the easiest and cheapest thing to use is some old ICs, so that they're extremely good for this purpose. You essentially put it in the drawer, you take your board, Rest it on top. Not only does it lift the board away from the metal base uh, of the drawer, so it allows air to get on around both sides of the board, 
takes the heat sink effects of the draw base away from the board. Um, but it also prevents the, the reflow varying across the board because there's no uh, hot spots and cold spots created by the base of the draw. So what you end up with when you do that is the third board I run through. As I said, I did all these today just to show the different uh, results you'll get. So the first board is at 237 on the base of the draw. This board is at 260 on the base of the draw, and that would have most likely have destroyed all your components. This board is again at 237. So you can see it's actually flowed this time, whereas the first time at that temperature it didn't, because this one was sitting uh, on top of an inverted IC away from the base of the draw. Not only has it flowed on top, but you can see it's flowed quite nicely on the underside, so these um, soldered lobs are sticking quite a long way out of the board, so it flowed extremely well through the board. So well in fact that on the next board I reduced the temperature from 237 to 225, and again that's flowed extremely well, and the solder's come well through the board. So then on to 215, and again it's flowed well, the solder's come through the bottom, then tried it with some components, and as you can see, it's flowed extremely well. This was at a profile of 210 degrees centigrade, so well down uh, in terms of peak temperature, and well, none of damage the components, but it's flowing extremely well. I'll try and get some high resolution photographs uh, to put into the, um, the video. Um, but the point is, we've come down from 260 degrees with very poor flowing to 210 with extremely good flow, simply by doing two things. The first is to use something in the drawer to lift the board off the base, and the second one is to create a new profile. Um, this video is not really intended to show you how to use this machine. It's um, similar in terms of what it will do to pretty much any other reflow oven. It's just not quite as clear in some of the menus. Uh, so what I've created is a reflow profile that is more suitable for this type of application. So if we pick the one that I've created, it's this one, and again I'll try and capture an image of or a video of the profile in action. But essentially what it's geared to do is to heat up reasonably quickly to a steady temperature. So here I've chosen 145 degrees and it stays like that for a minute it then ramps up to 155 degrees stays like that for another minute the idea of that is to soak the board get the entire board up to the same temperature um, but at a low enough temperature so you're not going to damage the components and then it quickly ramps up to the reflow temperature because the entire board is already at a relatively high temperature it doesn't soak the heat away from the solder the solder will then melt and reflow very quickly and then it maintains that for 10 seconds and then quickly cools down again to prevent damage to the components. You don't want to cool down too quickly otherwise you can cause the uh, components to, to move or to, for the joints to be incomplete. Uh, but cooling down over a minute and a half or so and then it will obviously finish the profile and you can take the board out of the oven. If you're not able to get good results, then it's either because the board is mounted incorrectly in the oven or because the profile is incorrect. The profiles are fairly forgiving. Essentially what you're trying to do is get as low a temperature reflow profile as you can while making sure that all the joints flow as they should do. And the main difficulties in doing that are when you have components that, that vary vastly in size and that can be a bit of a fine balancing act to get a good reflow without overheating some of the components. The main thing is to get the pre-soak temperature as high as you can but below any danger threshold for the components and the higher you can get that temperature and run it for a few minutes it's going to enable the peak reflow temperature to reach all the solder joints and it should flow quite uh, smoothly. So. If you can accept the fact you're going to need to do a bit of work on this to get it up to um, the, the standard that you really want, 
it's not a great deal of work. Like I said, it's just tidying up here and there, figuring out how the menus work, uh, interpreting the manuals to a certain degree. You'll find these work extremely well. But don't just throw a thermometer into the, uh, the drawer and expect the temperature to exactly match what's on the display. That's not what it's intended to do. You might find there's quite big discrepancies, you know, 10, 15, 20 degrees. But that's what you will get if you measure the, the base temperature or the air temperature. What you need to do if you want to check the temperature in here is to attach a very small thermocouple type uh, probe to a board tape it on well, tape it down, and then put that into the, the oven and then run that and see what profile you get then. Uh, that's pretty much it. As I said, don't be concerned by buying low cost things, but just, you know, you, you need to control your expectations. You're not going to get a, a machine that's the same as a, a £2,000 reflow oven for a few hundred pounds. But you should be able to get a machine that will work and it's certainly going to be cheaper than trying to build one yourself from parts that you can buy off, uh, off eBay or from Farnell or RS.